Good morning. Hope you had a good break. Uh, we, we took a few weeks off from the book of Acts, but we're uh, uh, now diving back into it. We, we got back to it last week after a four-week break and uh, for Palm Sunday and Easter, etc. And uh, we're going to continue now with a series through the book of Acts called The Church to the World. The title for the sermon this morning is, uh, What Did You Expect? And I've taken the passage um, we're going to be looking at this morning. It starts off with all the miracles that were done by the apostles, the apostles that were trained by Jesus for the three years of his ministry. And the evidence that it provides for the fact that the Christian faith is true. And then we're going to be looking at the response of the Jewish people, the Jewish leaders, the apostles, to that evidence that was presented. It's not what I would expect from people that are thinking logically really looking at all the facts. And I think what we'll do as we go through that this morning, I think in the case of at least the Jewish people and the Jewish leaders, they responded in a way that to me is very irrational, but it was based on emotion, not based on reason, not based on the evidence of the miracles that the apostles did. So we'll look at the evidence. We'll look at the reaction, as I said, of the Jewish people, the Jewish leaders, the apostles. And then finally, we're going to look at how we should respond to the evidence that we have for the truth of the Christian faith. Now, before we do that, I'd like us to just look back on a series of events um, that we looked at prior to Palm Sunday about what happened in Acts chapter 3 verses 1 through Acts chapter 4, 31. You may remember, um, this was um, soon after the day of, of Pentecost, after Jesus ascended into heaven. Um, Peter spoke to the crowd that wondered what was going on with people speaking in languages they, they didn't know. And then it talks about Peter and John, two of the apostles who were on their way to the temple, and they came across a, a 40-year-old-plus man that was crippled. It said he was crippled since his birth. And he was asking Peter and John for alms. He was asking them for silver or gold. And Peter and John said, well, we don't have any. But what we do have, we can give to you. And they miraculously healed that man. And he was able to walk. He jumped up and down, praise God. And it attracted, not unexpectedly, a big crowd. There were people that came in because they had walked by every Sabbath, week after week. They'd seen this man probably sitting there begging. And all of a sudden, this man's jumping up and down and healed of, of him, him being crumpled. And Peter's preaching to the crowd in the temple and he calls for them to repent and turn to God so that their sins would be forgiven. And then you have the Jewish leaders, the Sadducees. These were the, the Jewish leaders. They were part of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. They were not very happy because the apostles were talking about the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. And the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in miracles. They only believed in the first five books, the Torah, or the Torah. And they were not very happy with what Peter and John were, were talking about. So they had them arrested, and they put them in jail overnight. And it, they said, don't speak any more about this. We don't want you talking about Jesus anymore. But Peter and John said, I'm sorry, but we can't obey you. It's a choice between obeying you and obeying God, and we're going to obey God. And then, at the end of that passage, 
it says something that kind of leads us to the passage we're going to look at today. Peter and John are released from prison. The believers all met together. And what did they do? It says they prayed for great boldness. And they prayed that God would stretch out his hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through Jesus. They were praying that they would have the confidence to be bold, speaking about Jesus, even though Peter and John had been arrested and put in prison the night before, because they knew the persecution was coming. And they prayed that God would stretch out his hand to perform miraculous signs and wonders and miracles. Now, before we launch into the passage, the question you may say, well, why did they pray that? Why were signs, wonders, and miracles so important to the believers that they prayed for this? Well, I'd like to just show you a few passages that help you understand why signs, wonders, and miracles were important. First of all, you may remember the big issue, the big problem between the early Christians, those that were following Jesus, and those that weren't, was that the early Christians accepted the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the one that they had been waiting for. And the Jewish leaders that didn't accept Jesus didn't accept him because they didn't say, think he was the Messiah. And we're going to look at one of the, the most important passages that the Jewish people thought of, which led them to believe that there would be a Messiah. And that is this passage in Daniel 7. This is what Daniel wrote. He wrote, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, that basically means it looks like a person, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days. This one that looked like the Son of Man approached the Ancient of Days, which was God, and, and he was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. <clears throat> his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. You notice, and I've highlighted this in blue, they expected that the Messiah that was approaching God, this Messiah would be given authority and he would be given glory and sovereign power. They expected that the Messiah would have authority. And we looked, as we went through the book of Matthew, um, previous to this series on the book of Acts, we saw that the authority Jesus was demonstrating is throughout the book of Acts. It talks about how he had authority over sickness. He was able to heal people. He had authority over demons. He casted out demons. He had authority over death. He had authority over nature. He had authority even to forgive sins. And in fact, at the end of the book of Matthew, where Jesus commands his disciples to go out and make disciples of all nations, he says, all authority has been given to me. That was a reaffirmation on Jesus' part that he indeed was this Messiah that was given all authority. And glory. These are a couple uh, passages where it talks about what the Jews thought and why the Jews thought that he was the Messiah. It says, still many in the crowd believed in him. They said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? Surely not. They expected that the Messiah would do miraculous things, and Jesus did those. And in fact, it says the Jews who were there gathered around him, saying, gathered around Jesus, saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. If I do them, even though you don't believe me, believe the works that I'm doing. 
He said, I'm doing all these miraculous things. Just look, this is evidence that I am the Messiah. Now, this is something also that I, I hadn't, um, actually until I studied this particular, uh, uh, for, for this particular sermon, it kind of dawned on me that this was connected with the prophecy about the Messiah. Because you remember the Messiah was given all authority and he was given glory. You may remember in the book of John, in chapter 1, it says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. I always kind of had, had kind of read that, and I thought, well, what is... Jesus wasn't like, I guess except in the transfiguration, he wasn't shining. <laughs> when it says he... We usually think of somebody that's shining when we think of glory. But what it says in chapter 2 it, it answers what that meant, that he had glory. It says, when Jesus did he, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee, that's where he turned the water into wine, was the first of the signs through him, through which he revealed his glory. Jesus' miracles were evidence of the glory of God that one would expect that the Messiah, again, would, would demonstrate. Now, Jesus had that authority, and what we start seeing in, in the Gospels is he's delegating that authority to his apostles. It says, when Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority. He was given authority by God. Then he, as the Messiah, delegated that authority to the twelve. He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. Then we read in the next chapter of Luke, he appointed the 72 apostles, the ones that were sent out. And it says, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come to you. That's what Jesus has commanded them. Heal the sick. So not only was it Jesus, it's the 12 apostles, it's the 72 that were sent out. They were sent out to heal. And not only to heal, but they were to proclaim the good news. This wasn't just a healing ministry. It was a combination of healing and a combination of uh, proclaiming the good news about Jesus and the kingdom of God. And we see here in the book of Acts, we've already read one, we'll read the other in a few weeks when we get to Acts 14. This is what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. He said the fact that Jesus was doing miracles was proof to him that God was with him, that God was speaking through him. It says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you. How? By miracles, wonders, and signs. The miracles and wonders and signs that Jesus did were a confirmation that what Jesus said was true. And it says these miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. And then in the book of, of Acts in chapter 14, it talks about Paul and Barnabas when they were going on their missionary journeys. Again, they were able to do miraculous things, which was confirmation that what they said was true. It says, so Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, that's he's referring to Iconium, speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform perform signs and wonders. So I go through all of this because I want you to understand when they're talking about signs, wonders, and miracles, there was a purpose for them. It wasn't just that the, the apostles wanted to heal people and had compassion, which they did, but it was more than that. It was a confirmation of the fact that what they said was true. And as, as you may know, the apostles that was one of the signs of an apostle is that they could do signs, wonders, and miracles. And the apostles or their close confidants were the ones that wrote the books in the New Testament that we have. So you can have confidence in what you read about when you read the New Testament. And I will say also, this is one thing that distinguishes the Christian faith from other faiths. 
including the majority faith in Indonesia. The, the, the prophet of the majority faith here, in fact, specifically never claimed to do miracles, signs, wonders. What he said was that I'm only a warner. People challenged him, do a miracle, do a sign, but... One was never done. And he pointed to the Old Testament and he pointed to Jesus as doing miracles, but he himself was not able to do that. So we have evidence for the good news through the signs, wonders, and miracles that Jesus did, that the apostles did. And this is the passage we're going to study this morning. It says, The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. It says, And all believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. Solomon's colonnade is a, a part of the temple where the Jews would, would come every um, Sabbath, the Jews in Jerusalem. And it says um, people were bringing it. As a result, if you look in blue, it says, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow... <laughs> might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and it says all of them were healed. All of them. The apostles had the ability to do something that nobody other than Jesus was able to do, which was heal everyone that they came in contact with. At least it says so here. That's evidence that what they said is true. Now, we're going to look at the reaction of different groups of people as we go through this passage. I'm going to have you pay attention to how the Jews reacted, the Jewish people reacted, how the Jewish leaders reacted, and also we'll see how the apostles reacted. It says in in blue... It talks about the fact that all those of the apostles, you know, it says the apostles perform many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. And in blue it says, no one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. So some of the Jewish people, they came to the temple, but they didn't want to be seen with the apostles. Why? Why do you think? It's probably because they were afraid. They may have been afraid because they realized that the, you know, Peter and John had been arrested by the Sadducees, the leaders in the temple. And maybe they felt that, okay, maybe if I'm following the apostles, maybe I'll get arrested next time. Or maybe the Sadducees will kick me out of the temple and say, I can't come here anymore. Who knows? But they were seemingly afraid of some kind of persecution for publicly coming out and paying attention um, to the apostles. As, as many of you know, I, I do a lot of work with refugees, and I will just share some of my experience in how refugees that have come from Muslim backgrounds that have become Christians are impacted and the persecution that they face. First of all, I know some of them, if they are bold enough to tell their parents that they have decided to follow Jesus, what happens sometimes is the family cuts them off. They may say, I'm not going to support you anymore. I'm not going to send you money anymore. You're on your own. In fact, you may not even be part of my family anymore. And it may be somewhat understandable because of what their parents have been told. Um, to my amazement, um, I have heard that in places like Afghanistan, the, the teachers, the mullahs, teach people that Christians believe in free sex, Christians believe in getting drunk, Christians do not respect their parents, Christians make you walk on the al Quran. <laughs> all these things which aren't true. But maybe they think that what they see in Hollywood movies is what Christianity about is about, which is obviously not true either. But you can understand why a parent, if their son decides to become a Christian, and this is what they think Christians do, why they might, may not be happy with their son or daughter. 
but even, even now, I know some refugees that are staying in, in uh, a dormitory in, in uh, Serpong. And when some of the refugees go to church, the other refugees call them kafir. Um, they say you're dirty. They, they will make those kind of accusations against them. So there's persecution that someone faces today if they become a Christian. And maybe, maybe the Jewish people here were facing some kind of similar uh, issue. There's another group, besides the ones that didn't want to associate publicly with the apostles, it looks like there was another group that was interested... And in fact, maybe it was the same group as the first group. It says, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Okay? I'm assuming what happened is they were people that were curious and they had private conversations with the apostles, with the followers of Jesus, because they wanted to know, but they just didn't want to be seen. They were fearful of being seen. And if someone is interested in the Christian faith from a background like this, it may not be the best thing to invite them to church because although some may come, and we we do have people from those kind of backgrounds that come here, but oftentimes they're going to be afraid to be seen publicly. It's better to have a one-on-one conversation with them and discuss what the Christian faith is really about. And then there's a third group of people. It says, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets. This is apparently in Jerusalem. And then it says, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem. So there were people that were coming to the apostles, not necessarily because they were interested in the Christian faith or they were afraid to be seen publicly. They just wanted to be healed. They had a sickness, they had a disease, and they were coming from all over the place. And I can only imagine how busy the apostles must have been dealing with these folks and trying to heal them because it says all of them were healed. But it wasn't just that the apostles were healing people. It's that they were also sharing the good news. Healing people was an open door to sharing the good news. People come for physical healing And the apostles say, okay, I'll heal you physically, but I have something even more valuable. I want to tell you about Jesus and the good news of Jesus. I I wanted to share a story that happened at this church that this this reminded me of. This happened in uh, May of 2019. Um, There was uh, an Afghan refugee from um, Makassar. And um, he had very, very severe back pain. Very severe. He went to um, one of the UN agencies and asked if they could, he could see a doctor, if he could get medical treatment, um, and there was no positive response. So eventually this guy came to Jakarta with no place to stay, but he thought, maybe somehow in Jakarta, I can get help. There was a, this is in Serpong. He was staying in what's called Il Dormitorio, where a lot of refugees stay. There was another Muslim refugee in Il Dormitorio, which I'll I'll call him the Good Samaritan. (laughs) He saw this Muslim refugee with back pain crawling along the street. He couldn't even stand up. He was in so much pain. And this good Samaritan invited that one to stay in his dormitory room. But the guy couldn't stand. He couldn't sit. He couldn't even take a shower. He couldn't sleep. The pain was so bad. What happened was the good Samaritan didn't quite know what to do. And he said, you know, I think I've heard that churches sometimes help people. Christians sometimes help people. 
So what he did is he, he got online on the internet, googled churches. He, I think he told me he didn't even know how to spell church because he'd never been to one before. <laughs> Neither was the Muslim refugee had never been to church before. And, he's, and he's, he found JICF on the internet. <laughs> okay? So he said, okay, we're going to go to a church. And of course, so you have one Muslim bringing another Muslim to church. Just kind of interesting. <laughs> because of the severe pain that this guy was in. And they got a grab taxi. They were driving around Sudirman trying to find where the church was. I think they may have thought they were looking for a church building. They didn't know we were in an office building. So finally, through one of the security guards, I think they were directed here. So what happened is the church staff knew this guy was in so much pain. They didn't know what to do. But in that little alcove, if you go back to the rock room, there's a little hallway. So they, they put a, a, several chairs together and laid this man horizontally on these chairs. And this, this man, Afghan man, he couldn't speak any English. He brought his x-rays with him, hoping that he can get help some way. And the Good Samaritan could translate from Farsi or Dari to English. So he was the one that I was communicating through. Because so as soon as I walked in church that morning, I had a bunch of church staff come to me. Hey, Mike, Mike, there's a refugee. He's got problems. Please, please come. So I, I went, met this, this guy. And he starts showing me his x-ray. See, see. <laughs> I said, I'm not a doctor. I can't read these things. I, I have no idea. But I said, I, I said I, I'd like to help you, but I'm not really sure what I can do. And I said, I can take you to the doctor. We can take you to the hospital. But I said, the problem is I'm speaking in the second service in the Farsi service, which was during the during this service at 1045. So I said, I can't just disappear and go to the hospital because I got to speak. So do you mind staying around? So I said, let's, let's pray. And I prayed for him. Um, God could, could heal him, but I said, God may heal you, but he may not. He may use a doctor, but I'm not sure what needs to be done. And then after the first service, we, we found a wheelchair. We wheeled him over to the building next door where the Farsi service was being held. And again, we did the same thing. We put a bunch of chairs together, laid him horizontally. <laughs> and he, he, I spoke in English and somebody translated into Farsi. So that would have been the first time he was ever at church listening to somebody speak, uh, laying on his back. And the church service was over. At least he could hear what we said in his own language. So I said, what do I do now? So I said, okay, let's, let's go to Picanti restaurant. We're hungry for lunch, right? So we went downstairs on the second floor, or the first floor, rather. And we, I laid him out on the bench. <laughs> we got some food. I think, okay, this, this buys me some time <laughs> to think what I should do next. And I said, you know, they said he hadn't been able to, to take, a, take a shower in about 10 days, he, he hadn't been able to sleep. So I tell you what, I said, I have a bath, bathtub in my house, my apartment. So why don't you come, come home with me, you guys, and we'll try to see what we can do. You can get a bath, and hopefully you can get a good night's sleep and whatever. So that's what we did. And uh, when I, I remember going into the second bedroom when he was lying on the bed, and I said, you know, I'm not a doctor. I don't know I can pray for you. Um, you know, I'm a, a follower of Isamasi. I have many stories in the angel about Jesus healing people. I said, let's pray that God would heal you. Perhaps miraculously, if not miraculously, at least through doctor's provision. And I gave him a Farsi Bible, which I had. I showed him verses about Jesus healing people, as we find in the angel. And he took a, was able to take a bath. He was able to get some rest, a good night's rest. 
So after about a week and a half or two weeks, he was, he was doing okay, except he still had a lot of bad pain. We took him to the doctor um, who checked him out and confirmed that he needed surgery. And, you know, which is not inexpensive either. So I said, okay, what do we do? I said, we'll try to, we'll try to get you help somehow. And um, the Good Samaritan um, refugee, Afghan, suggested that why don't, we, why don't you go ahead and try one last time at the UN agency to see if they're willing to pay for surgery. And to his surprise, they agreed. Um, that was the first time they'd gotten any kind of response, and if you work with UN agencies, you know they don't easily part with money for uh, medical bills. So that was kind of a miracle in itself. <laughs> um, but anyway, he got surgery. Um, he got better, and then he started coming to church. He started coming to the Farsi service every week. In fact, he, was, he came to the English service, although he doesn't under, didn't understand much English. And then he decided to join a seeker class. So we used to have classes for people that want to explore the Christian faith. And after several months, he decided he wanted to become a follower of Isamasi, and he became a believer. So he's, uh, he was baptized. And then the Good Samaritan guy that brought him here was um, semi-interested, but we, we continued to have contact for the last four or five years. Every three to six months, he'd call me, and let's get together. And I mean, obviously, the guy had a good heart to do what he did for um, this other Afghan person that he didn't even know. And um, within the last six months, the Good Samaritan uh, Afghan, he uh, started attending church. And then he told me about a month ago that He's decided to become a follower of Esau Masi. He's decided to get baptized now. <laughs> okay? So I tell you this story just to share how helping somebody with the physical needs that they have can lead to open doors to help them with their spiritual needs. Um, the apostles had the ability to heal people miraculously, and we should pray for God to do that. But I'm not an apostle. I don't claim to be. I don't have that ability. I can pray that God would heal people through Jesus. Um, but I think we all can help people with their physical needs and other needs that they have so that we have an opportunity to talk to them about who the kingdom of God. Now, let's look at the... We looked at the Jewish people. Let's look at the religious leaders in Jesus' time. How did they react? Well, it says the high priest, and the high priest was head of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. The high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. Rather than being happy that all these people were getting healed, what happened? They got jealous. They were just thinking of themselves. They thought, hey, all of a sudden all these people are following the apostles. They're not following us anymore. They were jealous of that fact. They had the theological objections because they didn't believe in the resurrection, but they were just outright jealous. They were concerned about themselves. Um, again, I had, uh, we had a situation, this isn't with a religious leader necessarily, but it w was with somebody in authority. Because we, we heard through one of the UN agencies that we were paying people to become Christians. <laughs> Which was not true, definitely not true. And that's because when we did have refugees that came, if they were getting financial support, if they were cut off by their family, they didn't have anything to live on, we were trying to help them financially. Or let's say somebody came and ended up being in Indonesia a lot longer than they thought, we would help them financially. But we, we tried to make sure that there were certain safeguards to make sure people weren't just coming in the hope that they could get some money. And so we met with this person with one of the UN agencies, and we said, we want to tell you, we've heard that you're telling people this, but it's not true. But people will spread these kind of things about you because they see that you're having a positive impact, and maybe people are being drawn away from their leadership or their faith. And it says that 
they arrested, the high priest and his associates arrested the apostles and put them in a public jail. This happened before, you may recall, with Peter and John. They were put in jail overnight too, but it was just the two of them. In this case, it seems like all the apostles may have ended up being imprisoned. But it says, during the night, an angel of the Lord appeared, opened the doors of the jail, and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. Somehow they were able to escape from prison, and the guards weren't even aware that they were not there anymore. When the high priest and his associates arrived, this was the next morning, they called together the Sanhedrin. They called the Jewish council together, the 70-plus men, uh, which was led by the high priest. There were uh, uh, Sadducees who led controlled the temple, as well as Pharisees, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and they sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked, with guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found nobody inside. Nobody's there. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. What's going on? These guys are gone. Then someone came to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, and says, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared the people would stone them. In the midst of this miraculous release from prison, again, their actions were guarded by their fears of the people. The people were supporting the apostles. They were support- Obviously, it makes sense, right? The apostles were healing people. They were listening to the apostles. A lot of people started following what the apostles were saying. The, the Jewish leaders were jealous, and they were upset. And they wanted to use force to arrest the apostles, but I guess they had to ask them politely, will you please come here? We want to talk to you guys. <laughs> so they, they brought them in to the Sanhedrin. And it says the apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. The high priest says, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. You're not to preach or teach in the name of this Jesus. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with their teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. I think this reveals something about the high priest and the Sanhedrin. I think they did feel guilty. They knew what they had done. They knew that their actions, their response to what was happening was selfish, and they felt guilty. And they didn't want the apostles to talk because every time they opened their mouth, they felt guiltier. And... Peter and the other apostles replied this way, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand, his prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things. They were with Jesus for three years. They saw all the stuff that happened. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And with this, the Sanhedrin, 
people in the Sanhedrin get even more mad. It says, when they heard this, they were furious. And they wanted to put them to death. That's how mad they were. We want these people killed. However, but a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. He went, turned to the apostles and said, would you guys please excuse yourself for a second? <laughs> we want to talk among ourselves about what's going on. And it tells us what happened in that private meeting. Now you may ask, how do we know what happened in the private meeting? Because the apostles weren't there, right? But the reason we probably know is because we know at least two of the members of the Sanhedrin were followers of Jesus. One of the members of the Sanhedrin was a guy named Joseph of Arimathea. And you may recall when Jesus was taken down from the cross, Joseph of Arimathea used his tomb to put Jesus' body in. And then there was another person that was a member of the Sanhedrin named Nicodemus. He was the one that came to meet with Jesus in the middle of the night. You remember, may remember, and Jesus told him you have to be born again, not only of water, but the, the blood and the spirit. And those two men at least were in here. And so they probably communicated and told everyone later on what happened inside this meeting. But this is what happened. Um, and I just made a comment about Gamaliel, just for your background. Um, if you look on Wikipedia, he's a very famous Jewish leader. Um, it says he was the most famous Jewish leader of his time, traditionally listed among the heads of the schools, known for being a moderate in his view. Not only was he a moderate and well-known, he was actually, interestingly enough, the person that trained the Apostle Paul. Gamaliel was a moderate, but the Apostle Paul, before he became a Christian, was a radical. He was out arresting Christians. He was trying to get them killed. He was putting them in prison. And, and so um, it's interesting that later on the Apostle Paul became a Christian. He turned away from being a radical to becoming a follower of Christ. Did a 180-degree turn. But there's even some document, documentation that says Gamaliel, Gamaliel the, the person that we're reading about, there's some evidence that he may have become a Christian as well. And in fact, in the Orthodox Church, they actually venerate him as a saint because they say later on he did become a believer and may even have stayed as part of the San, Sanhedrin even after he became a follower of Christ. But this is what um, Gamaliel says when he addresses the Sanhedrin. It says, Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. And he t talks about two different men that were uh, causing problems and they were killed and then their followers were dispersed and scattered and nothing happened. He says, some time ago, Theudas appeared claiming to be somebody and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed and all his followers were dispersed and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas, the Galilean, appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, where Jesus has been killed, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. The Sanhedrin called the apostles back into the room and said, okay, we've decided you're going to be flogged, you're going to be beaten, but, and we want you not to speak any more about Jesus. And they let them go. Here you have the response of at least Gamaliel. He was an open-minded leader. 
There weren't maybe many of them in the leadership, but there were some that were open-minded. And then it says the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. What, this, is, this is one thing I just wanted to share with you. This whole issue that we've read about is because the Jewish leaders disagreed that Jesus was the Messiah. Interestingly enough, we live in a country where even people from Muslim, the Muslim faith believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Did you know that? In the Al-Quran, it refers to Jesus as the Messiah. The angel said, this is in um, the second surah, uh, 45th ayat. It says, the angel said, Mary, God gives you news of a word from him whose name will be the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, who will be held in honor in this world and the next, who will be one of those brought near to God. So at least in this regard, we actually have much more in common with our Muslim friends than we would with somebody Jewish who rejects Jesus as the Messiah. I, I, I should warn you, though, there is a big difference also, though, because most Muslims will n- not accept the fact that Jesus died. They believe that the person on the cross was not Jesus, it was somebody else. And so, of course, if he didn't die, he couldn't be raised from the dead. But um, there are several of uh, the um, Surat and Ayat in the al Quran where God is speaking to Jesus and says, I caused you to die, or Jesus is speaking to God and says, you caused me to die. So, um, using the word wafat. So, there, there are some verses in there that um, some Muslims accept the fact that Jesus died, some may not, but depending on who you talk to, uh, but just be aware of that fact. So, in summary, what were the reactions of the different people to the good news, to the miracles that were done? Um, Well, the Jewish people, some were fearful. Some were privately interested, but not publicly. Some were seeking help for needs that they had, or needs that they felt they had. What was the reaction of the Jewish leaders? We saw some were closed-minded, some were jealous, some were fearful of the people, some had feelings of guilt, some were angry, furious, and we saw Gamaliel, he's at least open-minded. Some were willing to listen and wait for the, the facts to come out. What reaction should we face or we expect when we share the good news with people? When we share the evidence that what we believe is true? And again, the Christian faith is the only faith that I am aware of, the Judeo-Christian faith, is the only faith where we see the evidence of, of miracles. We have the evidence, but we're, we're going to face a reaction when we talk to people. People that we talk to may be fearful. They're considering if they follow Jesus, what is the family going to think? What are their neighbors going to think? What are their friends going to think? They have an understandable fear. And we need to appreciate that fact. Because of that, they might, may be interested in talking privately, but not in a public way. You might want to have coffee with somebody, or tea with someone, or have lunch or something, just one-on-one and, and talk. And incidentally, I've, I've found... Uh, Indonesian people to be lovely in terms of when you have conversations about God. I, I, I find it's much easier and friendlier to talk about my Muslim, with my Muslim friends about what they believe and what I believe. Much more so than I find when I talk to an, a, a fellow American. Fellow Americans to me are, tend to be much more antagonistic <laughs> when you bring up anything about religion. But I've, I've found most of my, my Muslim colleagues very 
interested in talking about their faith and answering questions I have, and then they ask me as well. We have a lot of interesting uh, conversations and dialogues, um, but often it's private. Um, we will, as Christians, just like I, the, the, the story I told earlier, we're going to have people that come to us and ask for help from the other faith. Let's try to be as helpful as we can. I think Suryadi, as a, a moderator, he was talking and probably will mention when he's moderating, he, he, he's got people in his office that are Muslim that come to him, please pray for me. I, again, find many people in my office are very interested in me praying for them as well. There may be a reaction from religious leaders um, that are closed-minded, that are jealous, that are fearful of people, that feel guilty, that are angry. <laughs> Some may be open-minded. We, we, we may see all these different, depending on the person. But we need to be prepared for that. The apostles' response, what did they do? It says, well, one is they're rejoicing because they suffered. You know, I think usually when we suffer, when we're, if we were put in jail overnight, if we were, you know, getting attacked by the religious leaders, probably most of us would go, oh, woe is me, please pray for me. But they're rejoicing because they, they considered it a privilege to suffer for their faith, just like Jesus suffered. It says they were sharing day after day. It says they never stopped sharing. They took every opportunity to share. When is the last time you have shared with someone? Would that describe you, sharing day after day, you never stopped sharing? Or you can't remember the last time you shared? And it says they shared in the temple. They shared house to house. They shared anywhere, <laughs> everywhere. In your office, in your neighborhood, with your neighbors. We, we have some material that we use for our training for new believers, and it's called any three. It's called any one, any time, any place. <laughs> we should have that attitude. We be, should be willing to share with anyone, any time, any place. We should look for opportunities. Not just be willing to do it, but desire to do it. How should we respond to the evidence? Well, I would encourage you to be confident. You have every reason to believe, to know that what you believe is true. We have the evidence. We have the signs, wonders, and miracles that we saw that Jesus did, that the apostles did, that God confirmed what they said to be true. And we have their words in the New Testament. We need to meet with others. You, 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 you may have a very limited network of people that you meet with. Maybe when, at, at, if you're at the office or at the school or in the neighborhood, maybe you just meet with people that believe just like you. The same religion, the same ethnicity. Move beyond that. Move out of your comfort zone. And I think you'll, you'll find your life to be enriched by that. You'll have a lot of interesting conversations. There's ways also where you can meet people by serving. You know, we have, we, we talk about the orphanage and the, and the announcement time. You could get to know people that you wouldn't normally meet by serving in, through the orphanage ministry. There's Roshan Learning Center, where we have a school for refugee children. You can meet people from a lot of different countries there, from different backgrounds. You can serve. And they need, by the way, they need English teachers to volunteer. But you get to meet people. You get to develop relationships. And from that, maybe you can help them not only learn English, but help them with their spiritual needs as well. Bantar Gabang as well.
And once we meet other people, we try to meet their needs. We try to see what, what their real needs are. We need to understand they may have some superficial needs, physical needs, but we also need to consider the real needs that they have, which are their relationship with God. Be bold. Don't fear to share the good news. I, I have to say in the 30-some years I've been in Indonesia, I've heard from many people, well, I can't share my faith because it's illegal. That is not true. <laughs> this is a copy of the law <laughs> in both English and Bahasa. Okay, What you can't do is you can't commit violence, you can't have threats of violence and force someone to convert. But there's nothing wrong with sharing what you believe with someone else or having them share with you what they believe. It's good. Don't, don't do it in an antagonistic way. Do it in a friendly way. But I think this is not illegal. And pray. Ask God to give you opportunities to meet people, to meet their needs, to speak with great boldness as the believers uh, prayed. For those of you that are in a community group, I hope this kind of thing would be a regular part of your community group. When you meet together, you share, okay, this, is, this last week I shared with this person in my office, I shared with this person in my school or in my neighborhood, please pray with me for this person that they may come to faith. And then the next time you meet, hopefully everybody says, well, how did, how did it go? You said you were going to have lunch with that person. How, how did that conversation go? That's the kind of thing hopefully we have, we're doing in our community groups when we meet together, is we're holding each other accountable, we're encouraging each other to share, we're praying for each other, and when that person comes to faith, the whole group can rejoice together that somebody's been brought into the kingdom. Finally, I just wanted to share a couple of resources with you, um, if you're interested. Um, there's a video series called uh, Christianity Explored. Um, it's in English, and it's also in a number of different languages. Um, but this is a very good uh, video series, very well done, out of the UK. And um, it talks about, you know, for somebody that doesn't believe in God, why should we believe in God? Who is, who is really Jesus? And it takes you, um, and it's done very well, it takes you through the reasons why we should believe that Jesus is, is the Messiah. You can get this uh, through Amazon, by the way. And I know there are some people within the church that are even using this now with some of their neighbors. There's also this uh, book here called uh, Building Bridges. Um, it's a NAV Press book written by a guy that uh, was from Lebanon. And um, it talks about how to share the gospel with people f uh, of the Muslim faith. And uh, it's out of print, but we have reprints available. So we're out now, but you can get one of these at the uh, table next, uh, next Sunday if you're interested. But it, it, he bases his, uh, uh, um, the book on Acts 17 where it talks about where Paul goes into Greece and he's um, in Athens, he's sharing the good news with uh, the people that are worshiping the pagan gods. So this is a good book I recommend. Um, and finally, if you have, have an iPhone, they don't have the Android version yet, but there's a group called the Crescent Project um, that has um, an app that you can download and that explains how you can uh, share the good news with somebody from a Muslim background. It has videos and things like that. And it's called the Bridges Study. Bridges Study. And you can download that, and I think you'll find that to be very, very helpful as well. So let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good news that you've entrusted us with. We thank you for sending your son to die for us, raising him from the, the, the dead, giving confirmation of what he taught through the miracles that he did, signs, wonders, and miracles also that were done by the apostles. Father, we thank you that we can be um, confident that we have the truth. We pray that we might share that truth with great boldness and that we would be eager, not just 
only willing but eager to share the good news. Anytime, any place, with anyone. We thank you for that privilege. And if we face pushback because of it, Father, we'd like to rejoice to be counted worthy of the suffering and the disgrace that we may be faced with. In your son's name we pray. Amen.